Today we continue our series called Four Letter Words, where we are digging deeper on some of the words that Christians and churches conveniently tend to avoid. And these are words which may not be very popular because we oftentimes find them rather convicting to ourselves and also to our culture. In the first week, the word was fear. And if you missed last week, we talked candidly about the place called hell. You can end up there by rejecting Jesus Christ. As a side note, I've, I've noticed how some of you all want to save your seats when you come into church, and some of our volunteers will come early and will save their seats by putting their bulletin over their seat. And I saw this last weekend. It's a very troubling picture, so I, I, I snapped it. Um, <laughs> I don't know, I just, I don't think I want you to save me a seat. Uh, but when I saw it, I just thought, that's crazy, you know? But this week, we, we turn our attention toward the word holy. It was Eugene Peterson who said, in our kind of culture, there is a great market for religious experience in our world, but there's very little enthusiasm for the patient acquisition for what earlier generations of Christians called holiness. Here's what I hope that you will glean from our time together. Christians must pursue holiness instead of retreating from it. That's what we're to do. We are to pursue holiness instead of retreating from it. I want you to take your Bible out. There's one right in front of you if you, if you don't have yours. Look on your phone, look on your Bible. There's one right in, right in front of you and uh, turn to the last book of, of the Bible, which is Revelation. When you find Revelation 1, I'm gonna have you go 10 pages, eight to 10 pages back, because we're gonna end up in 1 Peter chapter one. So go to the end of your New Testament. I like hearing those pages turn. 1 Peter chapter one, and I'm just gonna have you all read this passage with me at all of our campuses. I'm gonna have you read this passage with me uh, out loud together, okay? We'll begin with verse 14. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Now I've organized this message into three different sections. And the first truth is simply this, God is holy, and he is. Any discussion of holiness doesn't come out of thin air, it's rooted in the fact that, that God is holy, he is the standard of holiness. God's holiness is distinctive, he, he's on a different plane. He is the creator, we are the creatures. Uh, he is the creator, we are the creation. In Genesis, Adam and Eve, everything was perfect in the Garden of Eden. Everything was perfect, that is, until they chose to disobey God. And when they sinned, they immediately tried to hide themselves from God. You see, sin always makes us feel awkward in the presence of holiness. Billy Graham has repeatedly said, I don't know why God would let me into heaven. C.S. Lewis says, no man knows how bad he is until he has tried to be good. And we've all experienced that. And Jesus, since he was God in the flesh, became the embodiment of holiness. And there are, are so many references to his holiness. In Luke chapter one, verse 35, the angel appears to Mary, who will be the mother of Jesus, and says, so the holy one to be born will be called the son of God. In Luke chapter four, verse 34, there's a demon-possessed man. He cries out to Jesus. He says, I know who you are the Holy One of God. Even the demons realize God's holiness. 
And remember when Jesus stepped up the teaching and the commitment level, and so a lot of people who had been coming and had been enjoying his miracles of him providing food for thousands of people, he turned up the heat a little bit. And so people began to walk away from Jesus. And Jesus looks at the disciples in John chapter 6, verse 67. He looks at the disciples and says, are you also going to leave? And Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. When Christ came to earth, he became the physical representation of God the Father. And he set us an example. And the angels and the demons and the disciples all recognize God the Father's holiness displayed through God the Son. That's why Jesus would say, if you've seen me, then you have seen the Father. So I want you to understand that, that it's his nature to be holy. And God's name is, is qualified by that adjective holy in the Old Testament more than all the other qualifiers combined. Now, why was it so important for the prophets and for the songs to remind people continually that, that God is holy? Well, I, I think it's because it's the very foundation. And otherwise, we would be building our foundation on something faulty if, if God wasn't holy. If God had sinned, then we wouldn't want to build a foundation of faith on him. And, and, and soon it would run the risk of crumbling to the ground if he wasn't holy. You know, every sports team has a chant or they have a cheer or some song or some activity to establish very clear terms, this is who we are. I grew up in Cincinnati. And back when I was a kid, the Cincinnati Reds were the Mac Daddy. They were hot as a firecracker. You remember the big red machine in the 1970s? Those were my years. And I'm telling you, we would go to Reds games and if the game was late and it was about the seventh or eighth inning and we were behind and somebody got on base, all of a sudden the guy at the organ would, would start playing this little ditty. And the whole crowd, we would yell, charge. Oh. I don't know why we yelled that because a baseball team doesn't charge, you know. <laughs> Anybody, It would make sense maybe for a football team, but that's what we yelled, and that was what everybody did. And if you were at a Reds game, the second you heard that, that sound of the organ or trumpet, whatever it was, you immediately got ready to yell out charge. If you're at a Louisville football game, I'm a Louisville fan, and if you're at a Louisville football game and we get a first down, the announcer said, and that's good for another, and the whole crowd says, cards first down. We go crazy, right? UK, when the fight song comes on, you guys just start to foam at the mouth, don't you? You know what? I, I mean, you're just in a, in a frenzy over this. Tennessee fans, Rocky Top. Right, am I right? You know, Tennessee fans, I've got a few friends like that, and oh, hey, you know, the world comes to an end when that's going on. You know, I'll be at a, cards, at, a, at a cards game, and, you know, toward the end of the game, some inebriated fan will stand up in front of the whole section, and he'll go. <laughs> you know what he's going to do, right? Right? And then he goes into C-A-R-D-S, and everybody's saying all this with him. Cards, 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 and we cheer like crazy. Why? Because we're proud that we can spell that five-letter word. <laughs> We high five with the people beside us. Yes, yes, I nailed it, I nailed it, that's right. But it's not just sports teams. Uh, around the 4th of July, every few years here at Southeast, sometimes we'll sing a group of songs for different military branches, and you know what's coming. I'm telling you what, get your handkerchief out. Because off we go into the wild blue yonder and the U.S. Air Force people stand, and. Over hill, over dale, we will hit the dusty trail. And when that song starts playing, proudly U.S. Army stands up. Anchors away, the Navy stands up. I mean, they stand so straight, so tall. And men and women stand with pride because the song represents who they are and what they love. In fact, many times while we're clapping, those individuals are standing, I will, I will visibly see a lump in someone's throat. And I'll see a tear stream down someone's face, and pretty soon I'm doing the same thing. That's their song. That's their anthem. And you never tire of it. They don't say, oh, no, they're doing that song again. Oh, boy, I guess i got to stand up. It's their song. 
never grows old. So here's my question for you. What's the anthem of heaven? I mean, every group has its song, they have their chant, they have song. What, what, what's the anthem of heaven? And Revelation chapter four tells us what the lyrics of the anthem of heaven are. You know what they are? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. In the Jewish tradition, people would use different techniques to indicate emphasis. One such device was a method of of repetition. And to state something a couple of times, I mean, really drew attention to it. That's why Jesus would say, truly, truly, I say unto you, or, or some translations say, verily, verily, I say unto you. And everybody would lean in. Wow, this is doubly important. This is the only time in all the Bible where an attribute of of God is talked about three times. Holy, holy, holy. And Jesus embodies holiness when he came to earth. And God the Father in heaven embodies total purity and holiness And so every time we find this passage or that phrase in scripture, they're elevating it to superlative status, to attach it to somehow of super importance by saying it three times, holy, holy, holy. You know the passage in Isaiah 6. Isaiah (laughs) says that he's a man with unclean lips. It's just a powerful scene as he has this encounter with God the Father. When he sees God the Father, the the train of his robe was so big that it filled up the entire temple. That's how big the train was of his robe. And there are these seraphs that are flying around and, and they sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. You see, Isaiah was a good man. He was a prophet used by God. But notice when when he has this encounter with God, the very first characteristic about God that has impressed him was God's holiness. The fact that God was so pure that there was no sin. The contrast between God's holiness and Isaiah's own sinfulness was overwhelming. And so he says, I'm a man with unclean lips and I, I live among the people with unclean lips. We make a lot of mistakes. We, we say things that we shouldn't. And that's the first thing that you blurt out when you're standing there before a perfect and holy God. You see, the anthem of God in heaven, the chant that you will shout is all about holiness. The very first song in the Bible exalts the holiness of God in Exodus chapter 15, verse 11. Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? The last song in the Bible found In Revelation chapter 15, verse 4, it says, Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name, for you alone are holy. And so the Bible has this bookend of of, of God's holiness, which, by the way, is, is this attribute that he continues to drive home by saying, holy, holy, holy. So God is holy. But secondly, get this, God commands us to be holy. All throughout 1 Peter Peter talks about our holiness that is based in the the fact that God is holy. And if we're going to be his people, we should look and act like him. Look back again in your Bible at 1 Peter 1, verse 15. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. So not only is God holy, but he has bought us with a very high price, the, the death of his holy son. And so we we should not live empty lives chasing the things of this world when we've been bought at an eternal price. But when it comes to holiness, our tendency is to sing about it more than we talk about it. And if we were completely transparent, there are many Christians who have no desire to have the word holy as a descriptor of their life. And they are merely Christians in name rather than actions. And to them, holy is just a four-letter word which carries a negative connotation. They say, well, I don't want to be labeled with that. I don't want to be a holy Joe. I don't want to be a holy roller. And I don't want to be holier than thou. And while all of those phrases contain the word holy, they are far away from the biblical meaning or use of holy. We've all heard people incorrectly identify holiness with with legalistic and self-righteous behavior, an attitude that makes everyone else feel like they are inferior. But that's not 
That's not what holiness is. Holiness means this. Here's a definition for it. It means to be separate from evil and set apart for God. That's really what it means. So let's, let's look at that, for we need to rescue the term holy from such misuse and abuse. Impurity calls out for us, and, and, and we need to run in her direction. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22 says, avoid every kind of evil. And then that second component shows that, that after we remove ourselves from evil, that we move in the direction of godliness. And we see ourselves and our actions as being set apart. We have, we have a higher calling, not in a holier-than-thou sense, but, but in hopes of pointing people to Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. So just stop and think, what do you need to purify yourself from that, that could contaminate you and keep you from, from holiness? Perhaps you, you need to take a break from the coffee group that has become more divisive rather than unifying, become more negative rather than positive. Maybe you need to find a different group with whom to spend your Friday nights. Perhaps it's a different group that you, you work out with. Maybe you need to fast from social media because it has become a tool to either feed your ego or to damage your self-image. Some Christians try to immerse themselves in the culture and they want to get as close to sin as they possibly can. It seems like they're, they're trying to get as, as close to ruining their life without actually doing it. And sometimes they even use the guise of saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be a witness. But it was the Apostle Paul who said, be careful if you think you stand because you might fall. You see, there's not even an attempt with some people to be different and distinctive in their lifestyle. But a holy person doesn't isolate himself or herself from the world and have no contact with those who aren't Christians. On the contrary, the holy person is in the midst of that setting and they're trying to make goodness and holiness attractive. Now granted, I, I understand this can be a very fine line to make certain that you're having more of an influence in bringing people up rather than they're having an influence in, in bringing you down. So I, I understand that. But being holy doesn't mean that you, you leave your job and you go up and that you live on top of a mountain all by yourself. What it means is that God has planted you to be the, the salt of the earth and the light of the world, that you strive to be holy and you strive to guide people to the one who is holy. And if we can change the way we think about holiness, it might just change more than our definition of the word. It might change the world. So we need to try. We're not called to stay away from God out of fear of being imperfect, and we're not, we're not called to stay away from the world out of a fear of getting dirty. We're called to approach God, receiving forgiveness that enables us to be holy and then fulfill his purpose. That's holiness. So please don't be flippant when it comes to the way you view holiness or the way that you view righteous behavior. This week in, at our home, in our, our Love Where You Are group, we were talking about our different church experiences that we'd had growing up. And one guy who grew up in a very rough environment shared that the church he attended some with some relatives as a kid, uh, a lot of the people he said on Sunday, they put on a really good act. And he said they played the role of being a Christian then he went on to say, but then when, when it was later in the week and they weren't at church, he said they would, they would offer me money to run some drugs for them. He said this, he said, so Sunday was the only day that they were holy. But that's not holiness. That's not consistency. It's playing a part, it's playing a role rather than pursuing a lifestyle. Coming to church doesn't make one holy any more than going to a hospital makes you a doctor. And today in our culture, people will try and fashion God into whatever they want him to be. If they choose to live a way that is contrary to what God says in the Bible, then the fallback position that they always have is, well, you know what? God's a God of love. I mean, God's a God of love. He loves everyone and he loves everything, so he'll get over it. He'll understand how I feel about something. Besides, it's his job to forgive. That's what gods of love do. But may I point out to you that the song of heaven is not love, love, love. The anthem of heaven is the powerful truth that God is holy, holy, holy. 
Don't misunderstand me. Of course, God is a God of love. But the attribute used to define God more than any other is that of holiness. And he asks us and he commands us to move toward holiness. So don't be cavalier about sin. And don't say that I I tried to make some changes, but I'm not really good at following through and I probably should do this or I probably should do that. No, this is serious stuff. If you don't believe me, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 and 27. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. That's a pretty strong reason to run toward holiness rather than retreat from it. God is holy. God commands us to be holy. And thirdly, God helps us become holy. Look back in your Bible at 1 Peter chapter 1 at verse 23. It says, we have been born again through the living and enduring word of God. So God's word shows us the way to holiness and to the lifestyle of salvation. God's word reminds us who we are and who has called us. Ephesians chapter one, verse four says, long ago, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy. He chose us to be holy. He wants us to be holy. And God never gives us an expectation without equipping us so that we can accomplish it. And Peter continues his line of thinking in in the second chapter, And he says that the goal of our being holy is so that people will see God through our lives and that they will glorify him. So we're not just holy just for the sake of being holy. We're holy in order to point people to our holy God. We are imitating the one who we want others to discover. But we've got to want it. We began this message by establishing how how holy God is. But our problem is that we've chosen the wrong role models in life. God says, I'm holy, so you follow me, and you be holy. But we have a hard time following in those footsteps, and so we tend to pick people to follow who we have a different criteria for. And holiness isn't usually one of them. We can choose to imitate God, or we can choose to imitate man, and more times than not, we choose to imitate man. You know, in 1977, when Elvis Presley lived, was alive, 1977, there were 34 professional Elvis impersonators. In 2002, there were 16,122. Today in America, there are 92,000 Elvis impersonators. That means that at the current rate of increase in the year 2049, one out of every eight people will be a professional Elvis impersonator. Okay? So look around in your row, look up and down it. Who's it gonna be, right? You can't be sure. You never know who it might be. Um, I, I, I could see that. I really could. I don't know, though. Kyle, he's, he's not a fan. He's not. Uh, uh. So who are you following? It's probably not Elvis, right? Uh, you might appreciate his music, but it's probably not who you're going to imitate. Who do you want to be like? And we are classic as a nation of choosing poor role models. All you got to do is go through a checkout counter of any grocery store and you will see all the role models that we've chosen. And they're really messed up in a lot of ways. Maybe we choose a role model because of money that they have. Maybe it's because of status that they possess. Maybe it's because of the way they look. Perhaps it's because of a talent they have. But God says, you, you be holy as I am holy. Imitate him. God has called every Christian to a holy life. And in the message of the scripture, it leaps forth with incredible clarity. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, Peter says that, that we are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. And when we come to Jesus to be used for his glory, something happens. You see, it doesn't say that we have to act holy enough and, and build ourselves. He builds us up from within. 
Does it take work and effort? Of course it does. But he is at work in us to point the way and make up the difference. You may know the name of Gary Thomas. He, he, he wrote the, the book Sacred Marriage. Elsewhere in, in some other writings, he, he talks about how he read a number of Christian classics from a century ago, and he said the one thing that, that had most significantly changed in the last 100 years in the church was a personal focus from, from holiness to happiness. He talks about how it is that, that we get so wrapped up in wanting to make certain that we're happy rather than that we're holy. The irony, of course, is that holiness is your best shot at happiness. We think that living a holy life will prevent us from living a happy life, that what's required of us to be holy is what we think we will, will make us holy or make us happy. But holiness means saying no to what we think will make us happy. But what we often learn the hard way is that holiness is our best shot. I mean, it is our best shot at happiness. People say, well, you know what? I, I can't hear from God. I, I, I'd love to move in that pathway toward holiness, but I don't feel like he he's, is saying anything to me. I don't feel like he's, he's teaching me anything. I, I don't, don't feel like uh, he's impressed anything upon me. Well, sometimes it's because we're on different wavelengths. Sometimes it's because we're not listening. Sometimes it's because we fail to pick this book up and read it. Sometimes it's because we don't ask Christian friends for advice. Sometimes I'll pray and I will ask God for direction and he gives me the direction and I know what he wants me to do and I know what the move is toward holiness. But in my selfishness and my pride, I go another direction because I want to be happy rather than holy. A number of years ago, advice columnist Ann Landers received a letter from a man who said, Dear Ann, I have a problem. I'm happily married to a great wife, we have two kids, but recently I've started dating another woman and I've begun to fall in love with her. What should I do? P.S., please don't give me any of that morality stuff. And Ann Landers tried to restrain herself and wrote back and said, Dear Sir, the only difference between human beings and animals is morality. I suggest you consult your local veterinarian. <laughs> We like that, you know? But we can be so steeped in our own selfish and sinful agenda that we just disregard God's word and we think that God's silent when really it's that we don't want to hear what he has to say and our mind is already made up. And we hear that story and say, oh man, I would never do that. But that guy probably didn't start off doing that. He started off with something much smaller and then kind of worked his way there. You see, down deep, most people realize there's a benefit to holy living. They just aren't willing to halt a habit or part with a pattern that is enjoyable but destructive. And so now it has become a rut that feels normal and natural to them. Someone described a rut as a grave with the ends kicked out. Earl Nightingale said, you will remain the same until the pain of remaining the same becomes greater than the pain of change. Is there a rut you need to find a way out of? Can I tell you, the only way out of the ruts you've established is turning toward holiness by the power of the Spirit of God, but you have to invite him in and be willing to change. Jesus said it another way when he was talking to a man just before healing him. He was a lame man who had been lame for 38 years. You remember what Jesus said to him? He said, do you want to get well? He said, do you want to get well? He said, what a strange question. Not really. In other words... Do you want to get well? Do you want to change in your life? Or have you become satisfied and so accustomed to the routine of sitting and begging that you don't want to be free to run and jump? That's a good question. You know, the best display of the holiness of God is the cross of Christ. It's a Calvary that, that we receive God's forgiveness and that makes holiness possible. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So Christians must pursue holiness instead of retreating from it. And maybe the most exciting truth about holiness is that God doesn't give us this large task to accomplish on our own. He doesn't tell us, hey, you go and be holy. Hey, good luck. And then he walks out. No, he says, I want you to be holy, and so I'm going to help you. 
I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. And the more you listen to him and spend time with him and do what he says and let him mold you into the image of Christ, the more holy that you're going to become. You don't have to do this on your own. So stop trying. The power of the Holy Spirit in us makes us more and more holy. And how you live and who you put your trust in, they determine whether or not you are going to long for Christ's return or whether you are going to dread the day of judgment. You've heard me say this before. Let me remind you again. People sometimes will innocently say, uh, hey, when I get to heaven... (laughs) You know, the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give Jesus a big old bear hug. I'm just going to give, give God a big old hug. Well, with all due respect, that may, that may be the second thing that you do. I'll give you that. But the first thing that you will do is you will fall on your knees and you will sing the anthem of heaven to the king of the universe. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty who was and is and is to come. What if you began to pursue holiness and you discovered in the process that, that repentance isn't a bad word, and in fact, it can be life-giving. And pursuing holiness doesn't have to be boring or a burden. It can actually be a privilege. And what if these things weren't joyless tasks, but they were invitations to draw you closer to intimacy with the Lord? So pursue Holiness, don't retreat from it because there is coming a day, a moment when each Christian will be totally and purely holy. For when we are in heaven, as 1 John 3 says, we will be changed to become more and more like the one we worship. And as we sing the song of heaven, holy, 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 we'll realize that we can finally be holy too. The battle to come out of darkness will be over because we will be in the presence of God and holiness will win.